I mean, for me, it's still been a little bit of the same journey since, like I said to you before, we're in, in groups of the four and our, our, our team as a whole actually can exercise at the same time. So we still see each other. So it's it's not like it's the complete drop off like some sports I think have, have found. Um, but yeah, it's definitely been a nice time to sort of relax back into things rather than having to go straight back to work again. Yeah, and I, I suppose, Cody, um, that would help with you guys, all with your mental health though too, wouldn't it? Um, being able to get into those groups and, and have that bit of socialization. <laughs> 100% it's been um, nice just to be able to you know like have your own time but then you can go out and go and speak to someone else in your bubble um, it's definitely make the days go a little bit quicker uh, which is quite nice so yeah at first we were thinking it was going to be a bit of a bit of a drag being in here but it's been really good to sort of um, reflect on the things that we've done and then also to um, looking forward to the future. Yeah, and, and Gareth, any highlights from MOQ so far? Uh, yeah, the, the the daily sun is always a, a highlight. I actually get no sun from my room, so uh, when we get to catch up together as a, a wider squad, um, it's always always great to yeah hopefully see if there's sun or we've got a bit of a hill to push up and down, get the blood flowing a little bit, breathe some fresh air. But um, uh, yeah, I've I've been keeping busy with a, a bit of work as well. So um, just finding things to to t- tick over with, and it's been good. Tell us, um, what do you guys believe is the popularity um, and the success of wheelchair rugby that has been since basically Atlanta when it um, was first introduced to now um, at the Paralympics? Um. I think for me, um, being, you know, only playing the, maybe the last eight years is seeing it grow from, um, I guess, when it first started, the game has just evolved, you know, it's getting faster and um, the hard hitting, like I think everyone loves to see a little bit of contact. So, yeah, and then when you really get to know the game um, and the different disabilities as well that I've found, like you can see, like you've got to have eight points on court and just seeing different disabilities sort of and their functions work together um it can make it pretty interesting so yeah there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes and tactics and stuff in wheelchair rugby so yeah it's it's a it's a fast exciting game and i think that's what um attracts people to watching it and we definitely need more of it on tv in new zealand i think what cody's touched on there's definitely the key it's it's fast and exciting you just don't see anything like it i mean how often do you play like dodgems with a ball or a demolition derby with a ball and chuck in disability sport at the same time. It's, it's pretty, pretty full on. Um, and there's so many subtleties that happen behind the scenes that, that I worked on and, and played within the game that people just don't notice um, the positioning and the, the, the subtle things that happen. So it, it's a real game of chess at the same time as being just a full on brawl. Yeah, I think Amanda's been quoted as saying it's uh, stress on steroids. A uh, chess on steroids, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one of those things, like the, the more you learn about the game, the the more you sort of notice and pick up on, as, as Greg touched on, there's a lot of complexities that come down to uh, each individual player function and, and their specific roles um, and how it all adds together um, to create one team composition and how that com- team composition will fare against another um, opposition. And it's constantly evolving and, and never a segment um, watch. So. Okay, so um, one of the old cliche questions, and I'm pro- 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 probably uh, not, the, not the first one to ask you this. Um, so, you know, going into the Paras, it was the first major tournament um anyone had had for two years since other coordinations which was the test event um and then of course we've had COVID how did you guys cope with that change I think you just had to keep really running with things whatever was thrown in your face you had to just reassess almost on a a weekly or a monthly basis at times um I know there was one case where we we changed plans spent about three days working out a whole new tournament and everything connecting with the Australians to run that. And then two days later, the, the board is closed. So the whole system changed. So you couldn't have one plan. You had to just evolve with what your original plan was and then work out what was going to be the best thing that you could use with your resources, along with what was going to be available and what you could control and control what you could control and then take a punt on the things that were, were variables and I hope they came together. Anything to add to that, Gareth? Yeah. 
um, we, we certainly missed the international rugby, um, but like Greg said, it was uh, out of our control. We, we tried to make some things happen and we don't have the luxury of, of living right next door with land borders to a whole heap of other countries that also play world Two rugby. So that puts us in the spot we're in and um, yeah, we were just prepared to keep rolling with the changes and, and keep moving forward. Uh, Cody, did you guys get a chance to mingle with um, you know, teams from the other countries? Because, um, I mean, there were seven other teams at the Paralympics or anything you know, outside wheelchair rugby? Um, not so much. I think for us, it was all about, you know, being there and being as safe as possible. And, um, you know, Paralympics New Zealand had a awesome, you know, safety protocols for us. So, we weren't going to compromise ourselves. And that was one of them was, you know, like sticking to our bubbles within our team and not going and socializing with other teams because, you know, it was going to be an amazing games, but it was a different games with the COVID. So for us, we really wanted to go there and compete and uh, get home safely. So yeah, we, um, you know, talked at a distance to, um, to someone or anything like that, but we, um, we made sure we were doing the right protocols um, firstly. Health first, right? It is, yeah, yeah. And especially for us, health was first. Um, so no, but it was still it was still an amazing time. Um, it's something that I'll never forget. And I'm super grateful, thankful, and um, just glad that that I did um, go and uh, um, and we competed and it was a it was just an amazing experience. Greg, um, your first experience as a coach um at a major event i mean you're a mechanic at uh have been mechanic at worlds a few other times in involvement um how, how did you how how different was it to, to adjust to, uh to head coach from there um i did have a little bit of a, a taste of it back in the day um so 2010 i was actually head coach back for the the world champs in, in vancouver so having been to an event like that you knew what it's like here, it is different. There's a lot more pressures involved. Um, so you do, yeah, knowing what, what I'd learned from that, that situation and knowing that trying to get the guys to focus more just on playing rugby rather than focusing on the event that we're at um, was a really key thing. Um, so for me, it was the same sort of thing. I just took time out of my day to make sure I focused on enjoying the moment at certain times. So when it came game time, there was, it was just the game you focused on. You didn't focus on all the, the hype around it or all the, the atmosphere that end up being lacking because there wasn't a lot of crowds but you weren't you know focused on the occasion you were focused on the game and I even commented to someone after the game it's like was there actually a ground like a, a, a venue announcer because I didn't really notice them but there was there was some guy constantly talking apparently but um my focus wasn't on that it was on what was happening on court so yeah so for me it was it was a really good experience to sort of compartmentalize it all and put one thing on on court and focus on that and then when it was off court take time to enjoy those those moments and yeah, bring it, bring it back to a, a different sort of focus at different times. That was actually one of the questions I hadn't written down, but I had in my head to say, you know, did you notice uh, any outside noise? Um, Cody and Gareth, I mean, as players, could you tell the difference basically with no crowd there? Um, yeah, I guess um, for us, you know, like we're not um, some of the tournaments that we go to, we don't have a massive crowd there or anything like that. So in a way, it was quite normal for us, you know, um, playing in a big stadium like that. But I just think the scale of it was a was a lot different. Um, it was a bit more, there's a bit more excitement behind it um, for what it was. But no, I think when you get on court and you're playing, you sort of forget everything else in the place. So crowd or not, um, I still think it was it was pretty cool to be there. Um, it would have been sick to have crowd out there, but you know it is what it is, and um, I guess that just gives us drives drive to go back and um, be in another one. Yeah, like Cody said, the, the last tournament we were at internationally was. Um, again over in Japan in 2019 and, and we had a pretty large stadium there filled with crowds and um, it's, it's, it's a pretty different environment on court when, when everyone's cheering and, and yelling and screaming and you can't quite um, hear the bench and, and your sideline and, and all the people yelling instructions and, and this, this environment was, it was easier to be sort of 
focused on what we're doing in the game and, and essentially less distractions because the crowd wasn't there, but it still didn't take away the 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 actual feeling and excitement of being at such a major event. And I still felt that quite real. Anything um, you want to expand on that, Gareth? I mean, it was your first um, either Worlds or Paralympics. Um was there any inspiration or anyone you sort of looked to in the build-up to help um, cope with those or well, manage the, those levels of um, expectation? I guess, yeah, personally, I, I I tried not to have sort of any expectations and, and take it take it as it comes, um, sort of be in the moment and yeah, really keep my focus where it needs to be to to help the team do the job we're here to do. So that was a, a lot of my focus while we're while we're coming into the competition and warming up and, and training and on the sideline just in the game, just trying to keep your head on the job that you're there to do. There's there's plenty of time outside that in-game competition to re, to reflect and and think about sort of the the the, the, the fact that you're actually at, at an event such as the Paralympics, like even going to the dining hall and the athlete village, it was really, um, really eye opening that we're at this global monster event that people from all walks of life and all people with all sorts of different challenges are here to compete in uh, not a huge number of events. Um, and so that was really, it was on my mind a lot at, at the event. So I just yeah was focusing on trying to sort of switch that off and and stay as focused on performing in, in our games as we could. So Cody, I mean it was your first tournament as well as uh, captain. Um, were you able to talk to anybody uh, beforehand, uh, sort of to help manage? I mean you're you're, you're a great person yourself. I know yeah. that. Um, and what was it like to be an athlete's voice uh, to the um, chef de mission, Paula uh, Tosarero? Yeah, Paula was awesome. Um, and it was great. She actually came to um, one of our last team dinners, um, which was cool. And she spent a bit of time with the team and got to know us. So she kind of knew what we needed and wanted. So, yeah, um, having her there was great. Having the rest of the Paralympic staff was awesome as well. Um, for us, we hadn't had access you know, to that over the years. So um, being involved in that, I guess, environment was um, pretty cool having different, um, I guess, aspects or, or things like that around us. But yeah, it was, um, it was interesting, the, the Paralympics, like it was pretty surreal, firstly, that we were there and we were finally there, you know, after a year's uh, wait. And then like Gareth said, you know, you're in the village and there's so many different disabilities, there's so many different countries. Um, it can be quite easy to, to switch off um, and go, oh, well, you know, I'm at the Paralympics, I'm not, you know, and the thing was to try and focus, we're at the Paralympics to play wheelchair rugby. Um, and I felt like when we first got to see the stadium, um, that's kind of like where it was like, wow, like we're, we're about to play against, you know, the top seven teams in the world we worked so hard to be here and uh, we're finally here. So it was just making sure we all knew what we were doing. You know, we had plans in place, you know, Greg had a good game plan for, for the team so we could go out there and, and that, but just touching on the two years of not, not playing any other teams, you know, like when we first got out there, it doesn't go to plan sometimes. And we knew that it might not go to plan. Um, but yeah, some of the teams were, were tough. So we just had to adjust. And I felt as the tournament went on, we sort of, we calmed down a wee bit and got our mojo a bit, um, back and, and things. So yeah, no, nah, but it was just all around a, a great experience and a massive learnings for all of us, including myself. Yeah, that venue looked pretty um, impeccable on, on TV and for it to have been used at uh, the 1964 games and I think it was even swimming uh, that that same venue was used for um, it's it was pretty impressive um, Greg I didn't play <laughs> um, when, it, when it came to the facilities and trying to get organised because um, you guys had such a small um, support staff 
um, how did you manage to get, get around all that? And was there a lot of, with the, I mean, the Japanese are always um, welcoming, um, but, you, you know, were they able to fit around what you guys needed um, to be able to turn up on the day? Yeah, it was it was quite handy having a small team because the locker rooms to, to get for dressing rooms before the games are quite small. So with our eight players in there, we filled it up pretty easily. So I'm glad we didn't have 12. It'd been a real jam-packed muddle in if we had, had to handle that. Um, but as staff-wise, we're used to having small numbers at times. We'll, we'll turn up to tournaments with five, six staff, and um, other teams will turn up with 12 to 15 staff for 12 players. So it's it's not really something out of the ordinary for us. We know that whoever's there, they're going to get in, get get the job done, and just pitch in beyond what their standard role is. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it, it's easier when you've got more, but at the same time, we knew exactly what we needed to do, and as a group, as a staff member, you know what each person's role is and, and it just gets done. Um, we did have a, a liaison person, Hiro, and he was awesome. He really fit in well with our team, had a good laugh, um, and he learned really quickly what the things that we needed were. So all of a sudden we'd be there and stuff would just turn up after the first day that we'd asked for the previous day. So it, it was good to have that. Um, shifting all our stuff around because we have so much when we travel, um, it was brilliant. Suddenly you turn up, a truck pulls up and 10 people are shifting 60 items of luggage. It's, it happens so much faster than when there's one or two of you doing it. So it was, yeah, a truck pulls up, you blink and everything's shifted. As fast as you can push it over, it's been chucked on the truck and stacked and the next thing's on and, and you turn around and you, you get on the bus. So yeah, there was a lot of help. Um, and the, the venues had, all had their own management and extra volunteers to help, help with things as well. So it did, it did run reasonably smoothly. There was always times where there was tricks and you just work with it because you're never going to change what their rules and processes are. So again, having got used to COVID and having to think on the run, it, it was pretty straightforward for most things. And I don't think the players realised half the time when some stuff wasn't going to plan or going right, it just got done and they found out where they were in the right spot at the end of the day. Yeah, and um, Cody and Gareth, what would you guys' uh, best advice be to someone that's wanting to, be, uh, wanting to play? Yeah, I'd say um, just reach out to to your local club. Um, there's um, in, in most parts of New Zealand, there's uh, clubs within a reasonable drive, and look, we're we're just we can't get enough players. Um, in the domestic league, there's a uh, space for everybody. Um, I mean, we have able-bodied people playing in, in two of the major competitions in the domestic league. The the sports really. In, inclusive and, and aimed at everybody so anyone that has a slight interest um just reach out you can look on on the world blacks um page if you google it you'll be able to find some domestic club contacts um even feel free to reach out to, to greg cody or i personally um we're we're happy to point you in the right direction and it's a it's a great environment whatever you're looking to get out of the sport so i couldn't recommend highly enough to anyone just reach out, come down, see what it's about. Yeah, and I think just touching on that, um, like wheelchair rugby, you know, I've always been involved in a team sport. So for me, a team sport was a no brainer and wheelchair rugby just, uh, as soon as I seen it, I was like, yeah, that's that's what I want to do. But the beauty of, uh, um, you know, the Paralympics is there is a whole number of sports. So, um, yeah, being involved with the Paralympics New Zealand and being there and just seeing all the different sports um, that New Zealand had, it was kind of like, if you do have a disability and you're interested in sport, just get in touch with Paralympics if rugby's not for you, um, because there are so many sports and there's so many opportunities. And I think sport is a massive um, pathway for independence, for for everything. But um, yeah, just my advice to anyone is just to, just to find something or just give something a go. And if you enjoy it, um, just stick at it uh, because it can take your places. And for wheelchair rugby players like us, like, you know, it was a dream of ours to go to the Paralympics and we finally did it. And I know for me, and I'm sure a lot of the other guys, we want to go back and we're going to um, get better and we're going to go back stronger. Yeah, and Greg, um, I, I mean, wheelchair rugby, like just about every sport, Always looking for volunteers, isn't it? Oh, for sure. Um, and we have some pretty legendary ones in, in rugby. 
but it's like everything. Every team, um, there's a bunch of volunteers that go on behind the behind the scenes. And it could be a simple person as just literally filling the water bottles. Um, could be could be getting the one of the high people up at um, Harvey Norman come along and dish out the oranges at halftime at training camps as well. Um, no, we have all sorts of people involved, and, and we're always looking for other people to get involved as well. Uh, it's like no one's ever in, in the sport forever, um, so there's always opportunities to grow and. Domestically, there's opportunities, but that, that extends beyond there into the international scene as well. What What do you guys think is the um, essential, um, what the one essential thing that is key to the sport growing, uh, not just in New Zealand but but the world? You can have that one, Cody. <laughs> I was hoping someone else would say something. <laughs> um, oh, I think. Um, <laughs> You know, like as much as growing over the world, I think obviously um, the way social media works these days, like televised things, like it would be pretty unreal to turn on Sky Sport and see a wheelchair rugby game going or just something like that. Like Duke um, done an amazing job, you know, um, playing the Paralympics and being able to see that. But it would just be so cool to have that on a more regular basis and have people being able to see it. So I think that's a massive way to grow a sport um, in New Zealand. I'd love to see uh, more people get involved with a disability and how to find them. I'm not, I'm not too sure. I'm not an expert on that, but um, you know, for me, I think, I hope people um, watch the Paralympics and really enjoyed it and might know someone that might have a disability that um, they can go, Hey, you know, have you thought about trying a, um, a sport? So yeah, that's that's uh, word of mouth and social media um, is is a massive thing these days. One of the areas I know they've tried to develop in the last few years is a relationship with World Rugby, and we're quite lucky in the last couple of uh, World Cups, Rugby World Cups, to have had a tournament at the same time. So, um, yes, yeah, so I think that that's one area that's definitely growing, and different countries have a, a really close tie up with their rugby unions. So. I think that's something just in general. There's a lot of obviously a lot more funding through the, the rugby rugby unions to um, to help with governance as well, and that's been something that wheelchair rugby's invested in as, at an international level. So that's definitely another area too that there's there's potential for growth and continuing growth in. Um, Gareth, what was it like? You know, you know, uh, first game you've you've done the haka, and then the USA turn around uh, doing their throwdown uh, pre-match with their mechanic Frenchie. Um, did, did it help motivate you guys with the Americans getting G'd up just after you did or how, how did you feel after that one? I think it's um, it's it's pretty much felt by all the players that, that are involved in the haka that the, the arousal levels coming off the back of that are, are pretty much at an all-time high and um, it's great to hear the opposition um doing their same little routine. But yeah, the haka is a really um, a special tradition um, that's been going obviously with, with rugby union and, and, and also wheelchair rugby for a, for a long time. It's it's what New Zealand does. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's really special to be involved in that. And yeah, everyone comes out of that uh, with, with a lot of arousal and a lot of energy ready to, to get on the game. So uh, it, t- it takes a, a bit of, um, refocusing to to switch from that sort of haka performance to getting ready to to sort of be at your optimum performance for wheelchair rugby but we're 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 getting pretty good at that and um yeah it's it's um it's a bit of a mental thing um but yeah it's it's unique that's for sure and Cody, what what what's next for the Wheel Blacks um, and, and looking f- forward to uh, Paris 2024? What's next? Um, well, I think we go back to, um, you know, the build up to this Paralympics is we knew that coming into this Paralympics, um, we had to be realistic and we knew that um, we weren't going to go in and, and smash it out and win gold like as, as hard as that is to say as we we wanted to go there and compete we were a young team and Paris was, was the one that we've always been looking at and um, I feel you know everyone's got that little bit 
well, we've always had the motivation, but that drive going, okay, like we can do this. <laughs> Excuse me, bloody throat. Um, but <clears throat> um, yeah, so so now it's it's all about um, we know we know where the competition's at, we know where we're at, um, and we're gonna keep keep working on it and looking to improve. Uh, hopefully, we can get a few more international games um, next year or the year after. That'd be ideal. So, yeah, it's, it's just moving in the right direction, and um, hopefully, you know, people who have seen wheelchair rugby might want to get involved and. We could find some uh, new players that that want to push us and be involved in the team, and that can create a bit more of a, a competitive um, culture, having more players wanting to be there. So yeah, because as you could see, we only had eight players, um, and most teams had twelve. So yeah, just just building the game. Greg, um, Worlds are coming up next year, but uh, something tells me there's probably a tournament before that. Yeah, so we've got uh, the Zonal Championships is planned for Auckland. Um, so at this stage, it's a case of seeing what teams are coming um, to whether it goes ahead, whether we can get the spots in MIQ as well is another factor that comes into it. So um, we were quite glad to be hosting that rather than having to travel and, and hang out in the hotel for a couple more weeks returning from somewhere else. Uh, so that's definitely, definitely a starting point. But I think for us, like from my point of view going forward, it's, it's really actually having a rest for a few weeks. Um, I don't really know the last time I had a few days off of off of rugby full stop. Um, that's probably going back almost a couple of years now. So it's just been nice just having a, a bit of time, even though it's, you're stuck in a hotel for 23 hours of the day. Um, it has been a really good time to unwind and hopefully bring the, the fire back to, to get back into it and, and get stuck in going forward. I'm ready to go, coach. Right out of <laughs> me in. Pull me in. <laughs> <laughs> you're feeling the same way there, the same way there, Gareth, because you're a little bit quiet on that front. <laughs> oh no, I'm absolutely keen. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it, it is nice to have a, a small break for rugby, but I'm certainly pretty keen to to get straight back into some some exercise and 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 keep building. Um, uh, yeah, I yeah know as a player what I want to improve on, and no time like the present to, to work on that. So. I, yeah, we a lot of us in, in New Zealand, we're, we we have busy lives outside of our rugby, so uh, so we often have to to find a find time when we can to to keep working on our our skills and our fitness and conditioning and and skills uh, in and out of uh, our domestic training. So yeah, I'm keen to get back. See, whereas there's a, a really good Greg size shape molded into this couch, which I think I might have to replace after I've literally sat in the same spot for like 18 hours a day a couple of times. It's been brilliant. Um, it, it's pretty much the time that we have, um, guys. I, I do really do appreciate um, you taking it your times out um, to join us for this chat. One, one last question, though, and um, Greg, it's directed at you. Uh, did you ever think of asking Calvin to slide into home base like you did uh, at Worlds? Oh, we actually talked about it, but um, did. I really didn't think he was going to survive because he was wearing shorts and just peeling him off the floor would have been terrible <laughs> afterwards. So, no, we, we need to talk about doing something crazy like that again. Um, but no, no, in, in the end, there was nothing that was going to be quite logical. And, and they did, they were sticklers for rules over there too at times. So it, it probably wouldn't have gone down too well with him compared to the people at Worlds. Yeah, yeah uh, if anyone isn't quite sure, sorry about uh, what Greg did, it was against uh, Ireland in the last, uh, the 11th and 12th match off the top of my head in Sydney 2018 and uh, slid onto court basically uh, into home base, didn't you, Greg? Yeah, um, the baseball style stuff. Yeah, uh, I think the commentator might have uh, been a little bit excited about it. Yeah, I think it was, <laughs> <from> memory. <laughs> it was a good week. Anyway, guys, um, thanks, thanks very much. Sorry. Can oh, I sorry, just, Cody. Yep, go um, for it, mate. Um, I just just want to say thank you on behalf of the Will Blacks um, to you know everyone watching and everyone who supported us at the Paralympics. Um, we really did feel the love and um, the support while we we're over there. So, you know, from us, thank you so much, and uh, we hope you you know we did you proud, and we're going to come back stronger. So, keep supporting the Will Blacks.
Yeah, no, good luck going forward, guys, and um, really looking forward to seeing your progress. Thanks for those that have tuned in. Um, Gareth, have you got anything left to say? Yeah, just reiterate that, that thanks so much for, your, for everyone ch- tuning in and, and uh, the, the support and, and love. It's, it's been it's been really awesome. Um, the the World Blacks is, yeah, uh, a, no, a name slowly growing. So the more you can uh, pass on that we play wheelchair rugby in New Zealand and, and come learn about it, um, that'll help uh, the sport and us as a team grow in, in all forms so so it's much appreciated anything else to add there Greg um I don't think it's much the same is it we definitely felt the love from from New Zealand back back home while we're away um but I think that for me the big thank you goes to all our like family um and employers while we're away that that supported us um it's, t- it's not easy I know my wife's at home with a couple of little kids four weeks on your own especially in lockdown it, it becomes a tough time so They've, they've done it tough, but at the same time, they're, they're right behind us as, as well, which is, is awesome. And all the teams pretty much working these days. So all the employers that are that are out there giving the guys the time to, to get away and, and be a part of such an amazing event and supporting them all through their training too has been been really awesome. So that's probably been a couple of massive highlights for me is the support we receive, receive on a daily basis, not just at the big tournaments. All right. Thanks, everyone, uh, for tuning in. If you've caught only some of the interview, uh, it is up on Bev's Broadcasting Facebook page as well as the Wheelbacks. Um, and have a good evening, guys. Enjoy your meal. Cheers, Bevan. Thanks, man. Kaki te Cheers, everyone.